Today we're going to talk about bumpers. I had some questions that came to me by email and phone calls about bumpers on shears and uh, from some sharpeners and uh, you know something we might want to look at. I've got a pair of shears came in today that need a bumper and even though Josh is off camera, wave that they can't see you Josh, but he's here um, doing clipper blade sharpening training but he's going to sit in today and watch me do some videos on shears and I think he'll eventually get into shear sharpening. Yeah, he's nodding his head. We'll come back and we'll talk about bumpers. Now, let me say this about Josh. If there's ever been anybody that could have learned off the videos without coming for training, Josh would be the poster child for it. He came in and um, with very little instruction, he was doing a better job than me sharpening clipper blades. I mean, they, all of them just came out perfect. He landed correctly, he lifted off correctly, he did the charging the plate, all of that just, and it was from watching videos. And I asked Josh, did you feel like it's a waste of time coming because you learned it from the videos? And he said, what? No. Can you hear him? He's in the background. He's so good looking, he just doesn't want to show me up on the camera is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> he looks. I told him he looks like a movie actor. He looks like the guy that played um, on the John Adams theory, series. I forgot the name of the actor, but um, he, he, that's who he looks like. Better looking though. Uh, younger anyway. <laughs> what we're finding that you can watch all the videos, and I'm hoping these videos help people, but they really should be in addition to hands-on, person-to-person training, whether it's me or someone else. It's just, uh, you can watch it, get the head knowledge, and even an online type of training where somebody else is watching you sharpen or do whatever uh, makes a huge difference. I mean, most people are hands-on learners, and Josh said he was, but I think he's a visual learner too because he was doing so well with the clipper blade sharpening. I'm just... And he gets here early, too. We normally start at 8.30. He gets here about 8. And so, what, about 11, we were through with the clipper blade training, which normally will take all day and maybe run into the next day. And so he's here today and um, kind of watching me do some shear sharpening, huh? Um, so um, I got in a bunch of shears, and one of them is missing a bumper. And I thought this gives me a great opportunity to talk about the bumper and also about sharpening icon shears. You may come across those. A lot of schools have icon shears and we'll talk about those. So let's take a look at these shears. So this shear was sent to me by a sharpener and um, I'm assuming this is the edge he put on it. It's a little suspect or maybe someone else in his area. I don't know. It's got a lot of nicks in it but the main problem is the bumper is gone. And you can hear it click 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 if you happen to be a hairstylist or barber or groomer um, watching this video um, anytime you hear your shears go make that noise look for the bumper being gone and with the bumper being gone the blades overlap so if you tried to cut with it with that bumper out it, it there you could cut yourself um, in the past now I usually throw in the bumper for free but in the past I would charge an extra five dollars of for putting in a bumper and I'd have people say no no just don't put the bumper in and I'm like no I'm not sharpening without the bumper because it's once that's sharp here it's dangerous and one of the reasons this probably has so many nicks is they kept it cutting with it with the bumper out and you see the blade is exposed so anything it touches it's going to nick that blade so there's two basic kinds of bumpers one are what I call screw in bumpers and normally they come in a, and we measured the little screw, the size of that. They come in a, a two and a half and a three. And those screw in. The problem with these screw in bumpers is if they're, you know, if you've sharpened a lot of the shears, the, you know, taken off a lot on the tip, and you've got to trim down a screw in bumper, there's not a lot of plastic to trim it. So if, you're, if your tips, let's say you put the screw in bumper and the tips don't come together, you can't just trim the bumper down like we'll do with the pull-through bumpers. Look in here and you can see those little threads if it's a screw in bumper. If it's a um, pull-through bumper, it's a little different. It's not going to have the threads. 
Now, just because it has a thread, though, doesn't mean you can't pull it pull-through bumper. And let me show you what I'm talking about, a pull-through bumper. Kind of all over the place here this morning. Too much coffee. See, there's the pull-through bumpers come in. We carry them in four different sizes. And on these, we're measuring the height of the actual bumper, not the size of the neck on the bumper. Does that make sense what I'm saying, Josh? Okay. I'm not, without having an audience to respond to me, I don't know. <laughs> so I've got you here, Josh, over here behind the camera. So like this would be a bigger size bumper. This is probably a four. These two are probably twos. These are ones. And this shear is going to take a pull-through bumper. And what I want to do is close it and see about what is the size of the space in here. See, so this would be the right size, this one here. Now, if I didn't have this size to fit, I could definitely put in this big one and trim it down. So if you got to make a mistake of buying bumpers, I encourage you to buy the bigger ones because you can trim them down. The little ones like this, you can't make them bigger. And any of the hardware, the screw, the bumpers, any of that stuff I do before I sharpen the shears because I need to know what I, where I'm starting. If I don't have if I don't have a bumper to fit, I don't have a screw to fix it or whatever the issue is, I'm not going to sharpen it. So this goes in here and I can't pull it with my fingers so it's good to have some needle nose pliers and I may have to go to the smaller bumper. This one might have too big a neck. I have gone in here and trimmed it down a little bit. Oh, and there's a third kind of bumper. There's the um, hard popping bumpers. I've got some of those. Those are you going to see mostly on the German scissors. They look like this and actually I've got an example of those in here. See that one? There's there's no hole on the other side, so your only option is one of these pop-in bumpers. And then there's also these moon-shaped bumpers, and I'll have one of those to show you. I'll try to edit in a picture, and we sell those. And hardly ever do those fall out, but you see them sometimes on Centrex, and I think some Joels have it. And they're not as common. But I do like them because they rarely fall out. We do sell those as well. Let me go back to trying to pull this through. I might have to go to a smaller bumper. Yeah, because if I keep going, it's going to break off. Let's go to the smaller bumper. And can you see all these little bumper pieces I have in here? I don't throw away anything. I keep those. You never know. You might be desperate, and that's the only thing you've got to put in there. And then, oh, and I didn't mention these. <laughs> those are rare. That's a little, just a little ball. We actually are, one of, in the very early years, 30 years ago, we had a shear called the Apprentice that had a ball-type bumper that glued in. And that thing fell out all the time. That is a discontinued shear. <laughs> Yeah, some of our, even some of our Banika shears make mistakes. All right, so pushing that through the hole. And if this is stuck, sometimes a bumper will be stuck in there, and you got to get a pick and pick it out, or drill it out. It'll be if it's a if it's a screw-in bumper and it's broken off in there, then you're in trouble. So I'm pulling it through, and I don't want to pull it all the way through. I'm leaving a little bit of a neck here. Now. There's a lot of different glues that sharpeners will tell you about that they use to put this in here. Um, some of the super glue, Loctite glue. This is nail glue that they use to glue their fingernails on. Those are both good. I've used Gorilla Glue. The problem with all of these glues is, like, I can't use any of them because they're all dried up. <laughs> uh, what I've been using lately... And I learned this from my son-in-law, Jay, is uh, clear nail polish works really well. It doesn't dry up. Um, 
It's not as strong as the super glues, but I'm going to show you what else we can do to this bumper that it's not going anywhere. And the letter I got from the guy, or email I got from the guy about the bumpers, he was having one that was pulling out. Um, some tricks are nail polish or glue, something before you pull it all the way through. That's number one. Number two, at this point I would sharpen the shears. Let that glue have time to dry before I start trimming it out. That helps. Number three, rather than trimming it out, he said he used a hot knife to trim this out. Um, I like to use, you know, knives or um, razor blades or something, but I have some old cuticle nippers. Okay, I'm going to trim this out in here and leave a little bit of a tail. So there's a little piece sticking up there. And then this, I can light it with my lighter. Now I've got three lighters here and because I don't know, probably one of them don't, doesn't work. One of them doesn't, let's see, ah, oh, that one did, the first one. And I know Josh has lighter, don't you, Josh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He keeps sneaking out. So, I'm see, I'm catching on fire, and I'm going to press in. Don't do it with your finger. <laughs> Wonder why. And see, I've made a little mushroom plug there. That bumper, bumper is not going anywhere. So, let's say that bumper I that first bumper I put in there went in there and it was too big and the tips didn't meet. I can trim that bumper smaller with um, a razor or with my little cuticle nippers or once again I could light it with a lighter while it's softened squeeze it until it's lined up right and um, then it'll just flatten to the other side. But this one is if anything, it's line, it's it's almost almost crossing still. But um, yeah, that looks pretty good. And that plug, see, it it may rub their finger, but if they use like an insert ring in here, that shouldn't that should take care of that. Okay, so let's go on to sharpening it. You want to see me sharpen this, Josh? Okay, so this icon shear. Let me talk about let me talk about icons. I got to be careful the way I say all this. <laughs> um, you see these a lot with cosmetology schools. They send out salespeople to the cosmetology schools with these shears. So you see, see them most likely someone in cosmetology school or just graduated from cosmetology school. They're usually really cool handle designs, really pretty colors. They sometimes are very hard to sharpen. Um, they are made in Pakistan. Um, it says on here the Rockwells between 56 and 58. They put a lot of information on it, and I do, I, I do admire them that they are upfront and honest about where their shears are made. This one, someone has really tried to sharpen it and has not done a good job. It looks like he tried to convex. Let me zoom in here again so you can see. Look at, look at the color coming off here. Do you see all that? Right there. He tried to convex it or something other. But that's, um, that's, that's not good sharpening. You can't put the color back on. I can't fix that. Um, so wide to narrow to wide angle. That could be just because it's Pakistan made. But I do see too much metal is taken off of that tip. You see how it kind of goes here and then shoots down? Where this one looks pretty straight. Um, and I'm, it looks like the angle changes from here. Like it's one angle, then it goes to another angle, and then it's, it's drifting, drifting down. And the ride line is still there. So, at least the ride line's not gone. Oh, it is gone there at the tip. There's no ride line right there. So I'm going to take these apart, work the ride line, and when I sharpen it, I'm going to have to sharpen it like a bevel, because if I don't, it's going to take the color off, which is what happened here. It looks like that person started to 
to convex it and then realize that's not a good idea. At least it's in the back. And that's the other reason I say to sharpen when you sharpen shears. Always start with the back blade because if you make a mistake on it, it's on the back. <laughs> and, uh, and these are put together right. We've got another one we'll look at in a little bit where they're not put together correctly. So you've watched a lot of my videos, Josh, and you have never, ever commented. Mm -mm. I, I, I think a lot of people watch my videos and never comment. I read all those comments and I answer every comment, unless it's just somebody trying to sell me some male enhancement paraphernalia, which those come in there too, <laughs> and I have to delete those out. Even happens in YouTube. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Can you hand me one of those microfiber cloths over there? Mm -hmm. But commenting lets me know somebody's actually watching. And if there's something, you know, I, I... Nobody likes negative criticism, but if there's negative criticism needs to be put on there, um, that's fine. Yeah, I'm seeing... Can you see that, Josh? You see the silver going up the back? Mm -hmm. Probably, even though there's a ride line there, they probably put their pressure in the center because I'm seeing up the back there. See a little bit here? Mm -hmm. So they may not be putting the pressure in the right place. That ride line, might, and you know what else I did wrong is I didn't check these to see how they cut. But I'm sure they didn't cut good because there's huge nicks and all kinds of angles on them. So... I have my new edge marker, which I was always using the red Sharpies, and I've gone to this because it's not as, um, it's easier to wipe off than the Sharpie. Sometimes you'd see me struggle getting the red off with the Sharpie, and you don't ever want to leave any of that red behind. Now this stone, this I'm going to go over it with my Nagura stone. I saw to clean it up. Probably time to flatten my stone. I'm the world's worst about not flattening my stone. Oh, let me say something about water stones. <laughs> Josh is smiling because that's the other call I got yesterday. Someone uh, bought, actually, it was this same water stone we sell. Um, it's a 2000 grit and it comes in the case. And it was this same stone. And he asked me about, he says it wasn't working right. And he says, what about soaking it in water? And I said, well, I mean, you could, like at the beginning of the day, you saw how dry mine was. You could put it, if you had a bucket of water uh, handy, put it in there. But I wouldn't leave it more than 20 minutes. But he left it for a week. These stones, some stones, I used to have um, an American-made Norton stone that I would keep in water. And um, in the summer, sometimes it would turn sour and slimy. So I'd put a little bit of soap in the water. That helped. But these are not designed to be soaked in water all the time. If they were, the case, you see, has like little holes in it. That's in order that when you put a wet stone in here, it can evaporate and dry out. These are not designed to stay wet. And some of the stones, like our Kitayama stone that we sell, if you were to leave it soak in water, it's a two-piece stone and it would come apart. So you definitely don't want to soak that, you know, I mean, wet it. You want to put it in a bucket for a little while, especially if you're getting ready to flatten it. But don't leave it, don't leave it um, in the water more than you know. 20 minutes is about the most I would do. So what I'm doing is I'm working the ride line, and I'm still not getting at the tip. And we said we didn't have any ride line at the tip to begin with. Still, my pressure's here. A little bit, a little bit more pressure there. The pressure has to be over the pivot. If it's here, I'm not going to get a flat right line. I talked to someone else on the phone. I talked to a lot of people that I have not trained that are watching my videos. And I don't mind. I'll talk to you. But if you call up and ask a question, you're wanting to know what I think and what my suggestions are. You're calling because you have a problem. I'm not saying I'm the only one with answers. But at least be open and listen to what I say and why I say it, do it my way, instead of arguing with me. 
and probably the people that are in that category, it's not Josh, <laughs> uh, probably don't even recognize themselves as being that. And you can disagree with me. I have no problem with disagreeing. But if you call me with a question and you want my answer, you see, I'm not getting a rod line there at the tip on this one or that one. Now, believe it or not, you think if you're not getting a rod line on the tip, you would push harder. But actually, it's the opposite. Because when I push hard, especially if the, the shears are a little out of alignment, and I bet they are, if I push hard, I'm flattening them out. So maybe a little lighter might get that little less pressure here, might get that, um, that tip. So many things are seem counterintuitive. Maybe a little bit more. So when you're seeing the rod line not be even, without even putting on the bar, I know that that one's out of alignment. This is a little device my friend Dennis Brooks made. See, it lights up. And you can see, it almost looks like there's hardly any bow in this scissor. All right, so you see that light coming through here, this slot. This is my alignment bar. It's really flat. I'm going to lay this on the bar. And I'd like you to be able to see this on the camera. I'm going to let Josh come look over my shoulder. I know you didn't come for shear sharpening training, but I was looking at I saw just a hint of light right underneath that, that, um, the point on those scissors. Let's see. See, this is that fiddly stuff like doing the rub block on the clipper blades. It's one of those things you can kind of tell just by using it whether you've got a problem but it's almost like there's no bow to it. You're supposed to be able to see light underneath it. So yeah, when I don't push down, you can see light underneath the blade, but when I, I don't know if you can see that on the camera. Yeah, I think you can right there if my hand's sort of in the way. And then when I press down, that tip sort of comes up a little bit, just a tad. I don't know, this might be one of those things, just trust me. <laughs> It's all like the rub block on the on the clipper blades. It's, I know people who check the alignment on all the shears before they start sharpening. And um, I don't. If I do the ride line and the ride line looks off, I kind of figure the alignment's off. So what am I going to do about that tip? Because I've got to have a ride line there. One, when I put it together, I can kind of shorten it. The other one, this is cheating. Um, I have these um, arc homes. And I'm just, and I use these on these scissors that are out of alignment. And I'll pull up a little tiny bit of a ride line. Yeah, that got it. In other words, without it, it's not going to be smooth. Because I don't have a flat ride line, but it's you, you just you gotta make the shears cut. Now on the outside I am not yeah, yeah, there I got a ride line. Um on the outside I don't want to convex them because I'd take the color off, so I'm gonna bevel them. And for beveling I'm gonna use a flat plate. And I'm not going to make them very sharp because we already know the alignment's off. If you've got a um, Pakistan scissor, you've got to shear the alignment's off, you've got to shear that you're fixing all kinds of other problems, you want to make them blunter. You don't want to try to make them super sharp because they're probably going to have a lot more problems if you make the edge too sharp and they'll dull out too fast. So I'm going to set these on 35. I'm not going to do a scratch test because who knows what the last person decide to shoot, um, sharpen them at. In fact, I see like two or three angles on here. So I just arbitrarily set my clamp on 35. Nothing fancy. I'm not going to rock it. I'm going to keep right here at the stop. Now, I don't always tighten down the screw. 
and I had someone, con you know, a little concerned about the little bit of wobble in the screw, it, I mean, the little bit of wobble in my clamp, I'm always pressing down so there's no wobble when I'm actually approaching the, the plate. What speed am I going? Oh, wow. It's going 80%. Okay, I've got a burr that quick. Man, I really changed that angle over what he did. He must have done a really sharp angle. I don't really want to do them higher than 35. I might have to do a slight rock just to blend in all his angles to my angle. <laughs> just for the... To look good, so I'm just, I mean, just very ever so slightly wrong. And it's good to, um, on your notes, put down something that you know what you did, so you don't think that you did this kind of stuff. You, I mean. So you don't think that you did this. And that's not from me. That was from the previous sharpener. And this one's got the tip that goes way out. So I'm going to take a little extra metal off behind it so I can kind of make that tip. You may have to shorten this when we're done. I don't have a burr at the tip. And do that slight rocking blending. Still don't have a burr at the tip. I think I'm going to go with something more aggressive than come back to this. Because I've got what I'm having to do, where that dips down, I want to take that little bit off behind there. So it's it's a nice consistent angle down. So this is a 60 micron. This was an 800 grit. There's kind of similar, but the micron seems to be a little bit more aggressive. almost there and it's getting warm you don't want to overheat the tip almost at the tip but if I lift up too much to get that tip I've just accentuated that problem so I'm just I'm working kind of behind it that's got it, I can tell. Well, I'm like a millimeter away, but... And these little cheap scissors usually are harder, take more time to do. Because you gotta, especially if you're going behind somebody else's sharpening. the way that tip looks. You want to see? You want to come look over here, Josh? Let me turn this off so it's not all that noise. You see, we, you were looking at that before. You see, I don't have the burr all the way down. You see how it's kind of a wide mm -hmm. looking thing there? I had one guy trained that was an engineer that figured this out. And it's more than just that it goes faster out here because I was pulling it across. So it's, it's more than that. But when it's tilted down, something about that angle, we'll get that. I'm not quite there yet. It's getting warm.
Okay, I've got it all the way down, but I still have, I still don't like the way that looks. I do a slight rock. Blend it in a little bit more. All right, let me zoom it in so you can see what, I've, what it looks like now. It's not perfect. But you see, I do have, a, have it all the way to the tip. But I still have one angle and then this angle. That's kind of unavoidable. But I do have a burr all the way down. And now that, that tip, the point doesn't look quite so caught down. It looks more straight. But let's see if it comes together. Now I could go back to my stone and remove my burr. I can go back to my arc hone and remove my burr. I could put them back together and just cut the burr off. I think I'm going to use this. And that did it, that little bit. And the reason I'm not going back to my water stone is because that's too flat. And this, these scissors are out of alignment. And sometimes scissors that are out of alignment, they actually cut pretty decently because it's like they're out of alignment together. So like one of those dysfunctional marriages, you know, <laughs> like a Johnny Depp marriage. It worked because they were both so dysfunctional um, until it got too much. So I'm just going to go over this just in case I've left any burr on the outside and then I knock it off. So let's clean these up, put them back together, and I have a feeling I'm going to have to shorten them, but we'll see. See how that tip cuts and see if the tip actually comes together. Still feeling roughness there. This is where I might go to the thousand grit just on the outside. Oh yeah, look at that burr rolling off there. You don't see that very often. Let's see if you can zoom in and you see this. See, it looks like a hair. This is one of those things that's just hard to see on a video. It's like a little curly hair. Now, if I'd left that behind, and these had deep nicks in them, so maybe I didn't get enough off of them. Uh, if I'd left that behind and then you closed on it, it would the two blades would be nicked up. I don't like the way that feels at all. So I do once in a while use this coarser grit, never on the inside. And you want to double check and make sure that the metal you took off hasn't removed your um, ride line. But I still see my ride line there. Ride line's gone. You got to go back, put it back on. I'm still feeling nicks. Sometimes, even with the nicks, they cut okay though. Don't ever take off more metal than you got to. It won't grow back like hair, even if it looks like a hair. So it normally takes me about five minutes to sharpen a pair of shears, but this one took a while. And I, I'm going to shoot another video about this today, but the square peg goes, goes in the, the round, round hole. hole. Goes in the round hole. Is that for me? Yes. Okay. Sharpening question? Yes. Josh, you want to put these back together? Sure. Okay. You put them together. I'm going to go answer the phone. There's the parts right there. Okay. You're on camera, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, so that's too loose. Is it too loose? Yeah, see it's too loose. So, of course you haven't had any shear sharpening training. You just kind of watch me on videos and it feels too tight. Somewhere in between. You got all the washers put back and everything, right? Mm -hmm. I feel it clicks. I know you put that in, right? That was somebody calling about how to do curve shears. You got any videos on curve shears? You can always, all my video titles, I have Banica shears in there, so you can put Banica shears and then curve or whatever you're looking for. So I'm checking to see if it cuts dry. Cuts dry. That tip does not come together. Tip does not meet, which does not surprise us at all. But what I want you to see is that it may cut wet, see? It cuts it cuts wet, and if I wasn't looking close, I would think, oh, it's fine, but the tip doesn't doesn't meet. And then if I was cutting hair with it, it would catch the hair. So my choices are bend the handle, trim the bumper, or shorten the tip. Normally I'm gonna do the bend bend the handle or trim the bumper. But this time I'm going to shorten the tip just because I know that tip wasn't, I wasn't happy with it. So let's just go in. Let's see what we got here. So if you get your light just so, you can see the gap in the tip. So I'm just going to come in here until that gap disappears. It doesn't take much because these are pretty soft metal. And then once that gap is gone, and then just you're just rounding it off. I think that's got it. And then you definitely want to cut some wet tissue with that tip and make sure you haven't done anything weird to it. See, it's not pulling at all. Special thanks to Josh <laughs> for putting these together. All these parts, these little bumpers, screw-in bumpers, pull-through bumpers, um, um, you know, all of these parts, we sell them on our website and... Um, we use grandchildren to count them out and put in little bags for you so it makes it easier. And the uh, only thing left to do with this is oil it. And I just put a little oil right here where metal rubs against metal. And always after you oil it, double check the adjustment and you see how that loosened up. And go one more click. All right. And that's it. Icon share.